Hello and welcome to the Terran Files. I'm Jimmy Young and today I have Merrill Eck, Chris Rosenquist and uh, we're going to talk about what he has planned for the city once he's sworn in. Good day, Chris. And um, Hey, how are you? Uh, uh, you had a good uh, Thanksgiving, I take it. Uh, yeah, pretty low key. Um, you know, we generally try to uh, get out of town, uh, but with COVID and everything, you know, it's been pretty limited. But uh, we we uh, we we generally like to just um, hunker down in a cabin somewhere in the middle of nowhere and, and just chill out. So it was a, a pretty nice Thanksgiving in that sense. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really awesome. Um, but um, during the Pride celebration that we had recently. You and I were talking, I think it was, mm -hmm. and um, you had mentioned to me that um, you heard Scott Beebe, who you were running against, mm -hmm. that it came down to management style when, for the city. That also, mm. you know, you have to take into account one's own agenda, but also one's vision for the city itself. Um, mm -hmm. What What is all that, uh, your vision, your agenda, and yep. what you see moving forward once you're sworn in? Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the management style itself, you know, and having a history of, of managing teams and organizations, um, it's it's one of, of transparency, collaboration, and trust, and that's uh, that is really the the uh, three key components going into uh, the mayor seat that uh, you know I've been impressing upon those department heads and the the city employees that I have had a chance to talk talk with. Uh, that that alone, uh, I believe, the found uh, creating that foundation. Of, of uh, transparency, uh, communication, collaboration, and trust is, is going to be crucial to uh, developing that long-term uh, relationship that we really need to establish uh, with our city, uh, with the team in, in the city, uh, both the management uh, the management team, the bargaining units, and um, all of the other staff, uh, city employees. So that's that's one thing going in, and, and I've, I've been able to, over the the last uh, several weeks, I've uh, been able to connect with uh, city managers and convey um, that notion on a limited basis. Um, but they, I think the majority of them understand that I'm coming in with uh, with that leadership style to uh, start to um, create uh, cohesion, uh, create uh, that level of teamwork that's needed in, in the city uh, and moving forward. In terms of the vision, and uh, you know a lot of a lot of what we talked about during the campaign holds true, and that that looks like um, a real strong partnership with the town of Plattsburgh. Uh, you know, I just spoke with uh, Supervisor Cashman this morning. Uh, I speak with Cashman on a regular basis on uh, the priorities uh, going in uh, into office for even for the first week. Uh, there are a number of other issues as well, uh, just housekeeping things, uh, but su significant issues uh, that that already are coming across uh, that need to be addressed that are bubbling to the top in terms of priority uh, employee concerns contract concerns uh, operational concerns things like that uh, that need to be addressed um, immediately uh, coming into office and so those you know those those regular normal day-to-day -day operational items um, that are going to um, be our priority obviously they are going to be the priority uh, then the vision piece is is really where where are we pushing or where does our city want to push and grow and develop um, over the next year and even you know over the next 30 years uh, so you know there's a lot of talk uh, in developing a comprehensive master plan uh, changes to zoning and planning that are going to um, help us push in that direction 
and um, you know, in, increasing tourism and destination marketing, uh, which we are a tourist community. We are a destination for people that that do want to tra travel uh, to uh, northern New York. Uh, and so making sure that we had all of those components in place uh, and the thinking around those components to, uh, to help continue to grow our community and establish, um, establish progress here. Sounds really good. A um, couple of things um, also that have been really in the news besides COVID um, has been the city budget <laughs> and talking talk mm -hmm. about uh, those in law enforcement. They have been very much on the edge and stressed out about the overall budget. Uh, recently, it does not include any cuts, but it also does not really include any um, staff increases from the previous cuts. And mm -hmm. something that Officer Miller has mentioned to me about, along with um, listening to a few others on the department, um, how would that yeah. be able to be reconciled? Yeah. Well, the, the, you know, there, there is certainly a concern about cuts. In, oh, there certainly is a concern about cuts in general, which, you know, the, the, the uh, budget that had been passed most recently uh, addressed um, uh, the first kind of concern about the deep uh, to the bone cut that we were looking, or we as in the city was looking at, um, considering in uh, pu in public safety and other depart mm -hmm. departments too, uh, community development was looking to get uh, cut straight out. And, um, you know, as we've seen a, a, an ongoing um, degradation of, excuse me, a, an ongoing degradation of um, services and recreation uh, that again, you know, we saw another you know, uh, deep cut in that department uh, as well. And so, you know, fortunately, um, uh, more level thinking came to uh, a, a more reasonable budget, you know, a 2% uh, cut in uh, the tax rate is, is not bad. Uh, you know, there is some savings on the other end through um, either attrition or through other cost saving measures. You know, it, it, that's one way to do it. But at the end of the day, uh, looking forward, um, we need to, as a city uh, and by department, uh, department by department, look at uh, not only how each department um, can save uh, in terms of uh, managing expenses and, and how they operate and do business, but how can they also offset their revenues. Now, not every department has the opportunity to offset their own revenues through the services that they provide or right pricing the services that they provide uh, but it's something that we need to consider and need to look at moving forward you know and something that I have I've certainly said uh, from the beginning in, in terms of making sure that the services that we provide um, are comparable um, obviously you know this the, the the city residents pay uh, taxes that kind of decrease the um, the cost of those expenses um, but at the end of the day, we do need to figure out, are, are we providing the right services for the right amount um, in, in the city? And that, that really uh, goes back to, to again, um, more of my experience in operational management and, um, and product management in that, in that kind of sense. And, you know, and, and again, speaking with the department heads leading up to um, a January uh, inauguration or January taking over uh, 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 of the mayor's office, um, people are in line with that. People understand that that you know we we can't just you know do uh, provide services for free. You know we can't. You know there there are a number of things in the city that we do for free uh, that that doesn't make sense for us to do that. And so really taking a look at what uh, what's reasonable um, and what makes sense in in that sense is is 
is something that we do need to consider as well as expanding some of the services that we're really good at like you know ems and ambulance service that's something that we're really good at we've got uh one of the highest trained um, workforce in our region to provide those levels of service. And so we need to look at how to better leverage that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that, um, and this is something that Officer Miller has mentioned to me um, concerning the uh, City Resource Center. Since it was open back in two, well, a couple of years ago, they, Officer Miller and has done a lot of good and the department itself has pitched in when it came to certain events that well all of the events that the uh, resource center has um, done to mm -hmm. engage with the community to put a, a better light on what they do you know because you know as well as i do that over this, especially this past year, law enforcement has gotten really put upon, you can say. Um, but when it comes to the department, he has mentioned that if there was any more personnel that were to leave for other departments or um, retire, um, that there would be a good possibility that the resource center would be closed because he would be back on patrol. How can the city kind of mm -hmm. reconcile that? Because he has been working, you, you know the organizations that he has been working with. So how can the city reconcile that, mm -hmm. that part of the whole public safety issue? Yeah, you know, and I've and I've spoken with uh, Officer Miller on a number of occasions, and you know, my my take on it is is one way or another, we're going to have to pay for uh, we're going to have to pay for that service um, in the sense that if if we don't have the preventative opportunities to address some of those concerns that and uh, some of those concerns and some of those issues that that uh, Officer Miller addresses through the community center, you know, we'll, we'll end up having to pay for it through. Our, jail system uh, or through our social or social service system and so you know the the opportunity to have and the need to have a community center uh is kind of like that first safety net that a lot of us understand is needed in our community either um that first safety net um that address versus the drug issues in our community or the mental health issues in our community, um, having that resource there to address some of those concerns um, before it gets into the criminal justice system is the ideal opportunity because if we don't certainly we don't want to uh, jail people if they're having a mental health uh, crisis we don't want to jail people both uh, you know with a with a drug addiction uh, and and uh, other you know drug concerns now there are certainly there there needs to be and there are uh, valid arguments for um, people who commit crime uh, to feed a drug habit or to feed a drug addiction and that that is something that we do need to address as a as a society, um, especially when 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 crime when crime is committed. People need to, um, you know, they need to restore uh, restore their standing in the community. But at the end of the day, uh, jailing somebody um, or or implementing some law enforcement measure uh, against somebody who's having a mental health crisis or uh, jailing somebody because they're addicted to drugs and 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 um, they've been you know caught with with a, with a high on the street or whatever that is, um, that's not necessarily going to solve the problem. In, in some cases, uh, and you can talk to experts about this, law enforcement and, and mental health and addiction experts, in some cases, um, implementing a law enforcement solution makes the problem worse. And so finding a balance where, you know, where we can leverage the community center to address some of these, um, these societal issues and using a law enforcement arm of the police department to address some of the criminal uh, the more pressing criminal issues in our community uh, and we do have criminal issues in our community and I know we're, we're somewhat shielded you know in that sense because we're a small, smaller community but um, you know making sure that 
that we use the right tool for the right job um, is crucial um, for our community as a, as a holistic approach, um, not just the, you know, hey, using a hammer for every every job that we have to that we have to uh, fix so you know from my perspective it is crucial that we maintain our community center and we maintain funding for our community center and even to a point as we've seen in the last year or two uh, partnering with um, social service groups and other not for profits locally to help fund some of that um, some of that approach uh, in terms of like as a shared service um, in our community is, is key because I, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if, if we can catch some of the uh, concerns early on um, in our community, that that provides a lot less stress in the system later on. You know, it keeps people in their homes, it keeps people in their jobs, uh, and it keeps people fed and healthy, uh, rather than then, you know putting them through a criminal justice system, which is just oftentimes we see as a cascade of uh, of uh, like a loop, uh, essentially of keeping that person in that system um, when they when they really could use um, help elsewhere yeah yeah um to be quite honest you have no argument for me on that point um mm. another thing that has been kind of um a contentious issue in the city too has been the downtown redevelopment project um for me personally, I've always been on the fence on that um, because improving the environment downtown does benefit everybody in the future. Um, the questions have been always been why this company and why and some people do have their valid points that there wasn't enough full community input into the overall project. Um, my understanding right now is that it still has to go through another committee or something like that for the final approval or? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, where are you? Yeah, so, you know, at, the, at this point, yeah, yeah, sure, at this point, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, you know, at this point, it, it, it's in the hands of the zoning board, and the zoning board needs to vote. Um, you know, I've gone on record more than once, and it should be pretty clear that my position at this point is is the same. That the the size and scope of the project isn't something that we that we uh, want want or need in our downtown we do need housing um sure a uh, hundred plus units of housing uh, regardless of what what um, level of uh or what market that housing addresses is going to support or help some of the housing concerns we have in our community is that the right fit uh, for that for that solution it's not and i don't you know and i've gone on record to say that it's not the right fit um you know a smaller scale development in our downtown is something that we would have liked to see. Uh, you know, the RFP for the Derby Street Reimagined was the one that got shopped around to developers. Uh, what came back in response to that RFP was not uh, in line with the Derby Street uh, Reimagined project, and that's when the city should have stepped in. That was years ago, right? That was years mm -hmm. ago when uh, when that project got shopped around, and the proposal that came back was not in line with that. Um, the response so that proposal was not in line with the Turkey Street Reimagined, and that's when um, a lot of the, the brakes should have been pumped on, on that project. Uh, but they weren't, and nobody can answer why they weren't. And as many times as, as everyone has asked, hey, what happened between the time that got sent out and uh, the RFP got sent out, and, and there was a response to that RFP that didn't match uh, the RFP, uh, nobody can say what happened and when. Um, and it, 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 that's, uh, and I think that's, part of the fr where my frustration is as well uh, because we did see a lot of the opportunity of a, of a, of a downtown revitalization uh, monies coming into our downtown to help uh, foster some of the growth and, and to fulfill some of the potential that we we've all been talking about fulfilling um, so at this point you know the, the vote is in the hands of the zoning board um, and uh, like I've said uh, I I would support a no vote on the zoning board and I think that's the direction that the zoning 
board is going to end up taking. Um, however, at this point, the zoning board really, regardless of what decision they make, they are an independent board. They can, they can and, and should make their decision independent of any uh, politician or any uh, community uh, feedback um, based on our zoning and planning laws. And so some of our zoning and planning laws uh, address community um, uh, community feedback and community benefit, but not enough. Uh, and at the end of the day, they need to make a decision uh, uh, based on our current zoning and planning laws. You know, one way or the other, that decision needs to get made. We're now going into the third administration uh, of of this project of the DRI. You know, in my in my assessment of our state relationships, it has definitely put a strain. Uh, on the relationship between the city of Plattsburgh and our state uh, partners, uh, something that I have already reached out to some of those state partners uh, to assure them that we are still in the business of development. We're still in the business of community development, regardless of this setback. And in the grand scheme of things, uh, although it is a major issue uh, in the city of Plattsburgh, I feel like it's a minor setback to the overall uh, global uh, and generational approach to what our city is focused on uh, in, in terms of development and it's a learning opportunity and if we don't if we don't take the failings uh, and the mistakes and the mishaps and even some of the successes uh, that the DRI has presented um, over the last several years if we don't if we don't learn from that then I think that would be the biggest mistake that we make uh, moving forward and in a lot of that does have to do with uh, again a master plan that that um, addresses this is zoning and planning laws um, that are quite outdated at this point. So, at, you know, at this point, it really is in the hands of the zoning board. And quite frankly, they just need to make a decision um, so that we can move on to the next phase of this, whatever that looks like. And nobody really knows what that next phase looks like. But we need to move on. Uh, we need to kind of, you know, um, put push through and, and make a decision on this and, and then, you know, pick up whatever pieces we can pick up and, and learn from it really. Yeah, yeah. Um, my, and ever since moving back from Vermont, Burlington area, my thoughts on the whole redevelopment of downtown has been more kind of like what they did back in the early, late 70s, early 80s. But Grant, you can't block off Margaret Street like they did Church Street, so. <laughs> Mm, yeah. Yeah, and the question is, what does that look like? Yeah. Like, what does our downtown look like, and what should our downtown look like? You know, there's a lot of strong town principles that have been floated around, and some of the people who have debated uh, against the development have proposed strong town principles that some of, you know, and then some of those group, some of that group doesn't agree with those principles. And so there's a balance in between you know, what does our downtown look like or what should our downtown look like? You know, my, my argument is that whatever it looks like, you know, we need to uh, develop uh, around our waterfront with a focus on our waterfront, uh, which mm -hmm. includes the Saranac River. Um, that's, a, that's a major component of what our waterfront looks like and, and, and the, the kind of the makeup of our city uh, or the identity of our city, uh, you know, Dock Street as well. You know, our waterfront is not just, just the beach, uh, and we need to take a look at what that whole picture looks like, and and start to define our community around uh, those natural resources that are not only here for for our uh, for our lifetime, but for you know generations and generations to come. And so, really making sure that whatever we decide is is a focus on retaining uh, and and uh, retaining that that identity and developing consistent with. Uh, uh, sustaining uh, sustaining that resource uh, for our use and for the use of of, of our of our um, you know the next generations and you know that's going to be that's going to be tough because I think everybody thinks uh, or certainly everybody has an idea of what that should and should look like uh, and we're, we will have to come up with um, some type of you know some type of community agreement that that is lasting you know when you know a lot of people complain about the water sewer treatment plant um uh down on down on our down dock street and sure it's a it's a valid 
oh, yeah. point. And when it comes down to it, it's not going anywhere. So how do we, how do we, you know, leverage that resource, which it is a resource and that, that, you know, we do water treatment very well and it makes money. It makes a lot of money um, for our community. And so how do we uh, maintain that level of, you know, service, even though it's the, the, the location is not ideal, but, you know, how do we avoid that kind of the development in the future um and that's really the the key for us to start to answer and address yeah um when uh burlington this is a long time ago we're uh redeveloping their waterfront they had the whole issue of a sewage treatment plant down there too so um mm -hmm. that's something to talk with the folks in burlington about but also they had to deal with yeah. uh, a coal fire power plant too um so mm -hmm. which they turned into really nice uh apartment housing and i know that those empty warehouses down along the waterfront when you uh, go past uh, the docks, mm. those can be turned into some very usable and good spaces for public use, private use. It's just a matter of doing something with it. Yeah, I agree in, in that. <coughs> Excuse me. I agree, and that that really speaks volumes to the reason why we need to have some type of plan or some type of master plan to identify by um, those types of development or those types of uses of buildings that you know maybe the owner wants to do something with it, but they're not quite certain what mm -hmm. or how. Um, or there's empty, you know, there's there's certainly is empty um, infill opportunities in the city. Uh, uh, that we can leverage uh, responsibly. Uh, but again, we need to understand what that looks like, what that landscape looks like, what those opportunities look like, and then start to market them appropriately to the right resources uh, in terms of developers or funders or, or investors or anything like that. Um, but uh, again, it comes back to wanting a plan and needing a plan, uh, aligning our zoning and planning with those long-term goals that we have for development in our city uh, that focus around sustaining our waterfront and leveraging our waterfront um, for public use and maintaining our waterfront for public use, but also using using whatever resources we have to attract people to develop and live here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you have also talked about working a lot close, the city working a lot closer with the town, but also the county. In what respect would that take form? Yeah, so, so obviously, you know, the, 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 the easy thing to address is the town. Uh, easy is in the sense of there's, there's a pretty clear um, path forward for how, how to work better with the town. Um, you know, the issues of annexation and the issue of uh, the Falcon Seaboard uh, concerns uh, and that litigation and then just a number of other you know concerns that we have for working well with the town um, you know we need to make sure that uh, we certainly that we're on the same page yeah the uh, uh, with the yeah. town um, and we've you know Michael Cashman and I have met mm -hmm. yeah the um, sorry to interrupt you but um, the Falcon seaboard but also some of the uh, properties that the city has been wanting to annex from the town that has become very a contentious issue between both almost adversarial um do you see how that can um be tamped down um i i you know quite frankly i don't have a clear pathway for how to resolve those issues and you know i, I and i don't think i will until i get 
into office and have a, a lot more of a clear understanding of what that pathway forward looks like. Um, but at the end of the day, it's been, pre it's been made pretty clear that there is a desire to resolve it. And, and there's a desire on both ends to Sorry, there's a call. There, um, there's a call to resolve it on both ends of, uh, you know, Mr. Cashman and my perspective to get something resolved, and that's the attitude that we're going into office with. And so, you know, without really knowing what that path looks like, and or you know, certainly there's some understanding or ideas about what it looks like, but at the end of the day. We need to come to some uh, resolution or agreement on uh, on what that looks like. Um, but those are those are like the I say those are the easier things because those are the most public, and you know we can address those those concerns, um, and we need to address those concerns. And I, like I said, there's an attitude to do that on both of our sides. The other the other part of that is shared service. You know, we we do share services now already uh, in a in a very minor capacity, and it's mostly as an, on an ad needed. Uh, or an as needed, um, or or just like you know, really like a, just an easier, minor way to share services. But there's not a real clear, concerted um, analysis or uh, approach to identifying uh, an like a long term or a deeper opportunity to share services. Uh, and so there there is an, there's an opportunity for our communities to get together, uh, primarily to get our experts in the same room to understand what that looks like, uh, what that shared service opportunity looks like, uh, department by department, and then start to suss those out and start to plan plan for a long term uh, that long term approach or that long term vision of sharing that services, sharing those services. That's with the town, uh, with the county, it's a little different. You know, there. You know, I as I'm exiting my position as a legislator representing Area Nine on the county legislature. Uh, you know, I, I have. Have had um, you know the opportunity to work hand in hand with a significant number of our department heads as the uh, county operations uh, committee chairperson. So you know a lot of these folks uh, I know personally a lot of their job functions I'm very well aware of what they do uh, and what they don't do. And you know even even as I'm even as I'm exiting my position there, having conversations with the IT department on. Uh, long-term strategy for sharing IT services, uh, understanding the civil service, uh, shared service that we do with the county already, um, and even even the uh, tax assessment that the county provides as a service to the city of Plattsburgh and understanding the nuances of that. So, you know, as we, as we start to get deeper into the operational uh, concerns of the city, you know, I do have a lot of these resources that I can reach out to and just touch base with and say, hey, look, this is a, this is our, short term and this is our long term strategy for this for this operation. How can we partner with the county or how can we partner with the town to make it a lot more effective regionally for us all? So there's a, there's certainly an attitude there for shared service and I think that's gonna be a big win for us in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we all have to work together no matter what. But, um, mm -hmm. So um I think that's about it. Um, so, um, a little bit of uh, your history is that you um, grew up in the Air Force. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, your personal thoughts on closing of the air base seeing that it's been 25 years and um your thoughts on how the redevelopment of the base has gone um yeah so the, my personal thoughts on the closing of the air base i mean i was a kid at the time when it closed uh, i think i was just wrapping up um, I, um, I was wrapping up my degree at Clinton, and it didn't. It, I don't know if it necessarily had a direct impact on me 
personally, um, mostly because my father had retired, my family had retired from the Air Force um, by that time, and, and we were well outside of the Air Force. We, you know, we decided to stay in the area and, uh, and uh, grow here uh, as a family. Um, uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, one of the things that we lost as a community is the amount of diversity that the uh, applies for the Air Force Base brought. Um, uh, diversity of uh, uh, people of color, uh, people from different regions uh, throughout the world, uh, and um, the amount of income and, and economic opportunity that the Air Base brought uh, with the uh, with the money um, that, you know, uh, the money that was brought into our community um, from, from people who lived on the Air Base. So that was a, a big hit for us. But, you know, in terms of the diversity of our community, you know, we can look at SUNY and we can look to SUNY to help us understand how we can be and should be a more accepting uh, community to, uh, to people from different areas and, and people from diff different ethnic, uh, racial, and um, uh, 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 just a diverse number of backgrounds uh, that, that uh, we just don't always have an opportunity to understand. You know, as somebody who, you know, I grew up in our community here, I grew up in Plattsburgh, and I've lived in a lot bigger cities. And to understand how diversity makes us better, uh, more rounded, uh, more well-versed, uh, and how we can compete um, even locally and uh, re locally, regionally, and internationally as a community um, if we if we understand diversity a lot better and start to attract people here uh, from from that perspective I think it's key for us to to understand um, how to uh, how to balance that with our own identity and that's the other thing is is us us really understanding who we are and what our identity is as a community I think that's something that we can do better at uh, I just don't think we have a good sense of who we are uh, and how we identify to fire ourselves as a community, uh, and what off what offerings we have for people uh, to to live, work, and play here. Um, but then, you know, at, at the yeah, on the other side, you know, I I am not I'm not entirely familiar with how um, the base, uh, the old Air Force base, was split up between the town and the city. Um, you know, it, it is interesting that the uh, town um, got the airport uh, on in the town side in a lot of the industrial space and we got a lot of the residential space which you know it, it makes sense um it makes sense now um but at the end of the day uh, there's just a real strong partnership that we have with the town to help develop and continue developing um those parts of the air base that um uh, the old air force base that that kind of share uh share that border um and uh and we'll i think we can continue to do that not only just at the air at the air force base but in other areas as well Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just wanted to get your thoughts on that but um thanks for coming on and you have a nice day yeah thank you i appreciate it if i could plug um if i could plug our social channels um i would really appreciate uh people sure, sure. grabbing us on uh facebook instagram and youtube yeah awesome uh, um, yeah, we're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. Um, we'd love to have you all follow us on those platforms. Um, as we start to come into office, you know, we've, we have a lot of content planned for YouTube. Um, you know, a lot of uh, longer and shorter format uh, videos that people can follow us and, you know, just follow the mayor's office and, and you know, that day-to-day -day kind of lift the veil on the, even the day-to-day -day operations of what is it to be a mayor in a small town? Um, what is it to be a mayor in Plasma? And people, you know, having people understand um, the access and availability uh, of of that office. So I'd appreciate it. Yep, not a problem, Chris. Well, that's going to be the last yeah. show for this uh, year. I'll be back next year. <laughs> Till then, Fair. have fun. And right on.